these interpreters there are much more than language interpreters. They're cultural guides and bodyguards, and in this instance, and soldiers. They were very unhappy about A, the fact that these tenders are even being released in the first place. They would rather that the assignments were granted to individual linguists. And we provide direct integrations so that they have tools, they have flexibility. Like even being in the same booth, providing interpretation to the same language, one interpreter could be online and, and other could be on site. And welcome to Slaterpod 74 from beautiful and sunny Zurich. It's beautiful and sunny in London as well. Pan European sunshine <laughs> today. Fantastic. Cool. So uh, hi, Esther. Today, news-driven podcast. So last week, we reported that uh, remote interpreting startup Interactio has raised a $30 million Series A round. Mm -hmm. And guess what? Today, we have Simona Andriauskaite, co-founder and chief business development officer of Interactio on the pod. Great. There you go. So, you know, last week in the news, this week on the pod. That's what you come here for. Great content. <laughs> Other than that, we'll keep it, uh, we'll keep it relatively short today. It's been, uh, it's been a busy week on other things and, uh, there, there's only so much on the news side we can talk to, but today we quickly talk again about raising money in Australia. Um, you know, what can we do? Again, Straker raising money, publishing results interesting from um, from kind of a sea level and uh, strategic level component. Uh, there was a job dip in our index for the first time. Yeah. Unfortunately. Sad. <laughs> so let's look into that. Then there's this interpreting route, like the whole judicial interpreting sector is apparently going under a single contract. We covered it a year ago and now it's this is being rolled out uh, despite some of the back pushback from interpreters. And then something that struck me, we didn't cover it um, on Slitter.com, but we had it in our uh, sweep news service. So uh, around Afghan interpreters and mm. uh, how they're being um, treated slash brought back maybe to the, to the US. All right, first briefly, again, a company that uh, is one of the probably most regularly featured company in this podcast because they're publicly listed and give us a lot of information to chew on. And just prior to the podcast, Esther, we chewed on yes, how exactly did. that that listing is going did to happen. Did our very best that, to sorry, unpack that. it all. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, just, just this is not fun. Let, let me add a disclaimer. This is not financial advice. You know, we don't have any, we're not chartered financial analysts and, uh, you know, it's, it's relatively hard for us to, to unpack the exact nature of, of this. And what is this? This is a, a capital raise, uh, from the stock market because Straker Translations is listed in Australia, as we said many times. And they raised, they announced they're going to raise 20 million Aussie dollars. So that's roughly 15 million US dollars. And here's here's the the tricky part, which we had to unpack before we ran the story. So apparently, half of this is a quote unquote placement mm. that may or may not be private, but it's it's a placement that goes out to institutional investors, right? A sophisticated investors. So basically, rich people that go through a family office or something, or like institutionalists, like you know, uh, wealth managers or, or asset managers. Now, the other half, uh, the other half, the, the ten million Aussie dollars is. Go is, is also is subdivided into two. One is going in, in, a, in an accelerated offering also to institutionals, mm. and the other half is going to retail. So, you know, you and I, uh, if we were in, inclined to do so, could, could invest. And, and that part's happening, that offering is happening in the next few weeks. So, the long and the short here is that Straker's raising capital to pay down debt. They had that debt from the Lingotech acquisition mm. a few months ago and, uh, of course, get you know equity on the balance sheet. So that gears them up for more M&A and probably some other investments as they're uh, growing uh, you know, their business uh, more generally. Uh, it, it's interesting that you know, Straker is one of the few companies here that's really using the public markets aggressively to fund growth. I mean, the other one being, of course, RWS on, on a kind of 10x, 20x level. But uh, but Strake is using that um, to to their advantage, and yeah, good for them. So what's again different from some of the other LSPs is that they grow either organically or if they do grow by M and A, they're mostly backed by private equity investors. Those investment mm -hmm. funds that are all over the 
the language industry. So yeah, it's interesting to see uh, what's going on. The shares rallied ahead of the announcement. Yeah, um, that's interesting. You know, ahead of the announcement. So they're well. All, we spoke about it the other week as well that their shares had already did, hit. Yeah, they already hit an all-time high after their annual results were released, and I think they kept climbing. After. Yeah, they kept climbing. Now they're mm. now they're all-time high. So this company's worth a hundred million dollars. Yeah. So let's not dive into that. But anyway, interesting. Another. Another capital markets uh, transaction for Straker there, and um, and uh, you know, good on them. More more M and A, less debt. Um, if the investor interest is there, why not? So, what's going on in the job market, Esther? Yeah, um, I mean, it sounds like a, a a sort of not bad, but a sort of less positive headline than, than what we have seen for the job index in the past few months. But actually, um, despite the dip in June, the, the job index is still at its second highest level ever. So I think keep that in the back of our minds. But it did dip um, uh, nearly five points from May. Um, so this is the index that we use to track hiring and employment activity uh, and demand in the language industry. It's the first time it's shrunk uh, since January 2021. So it was on a four-month growth streak. Um, but like I said, it's still pretty high and it is 26 points ahead of where it was at the start of the year. So, yes. That's Worse good. than last month, but That's not, good. but generally still on an upward upward trajectory, which I think is quite consistent with what we're seeing in terms of you know, booming activity in, in, in the industry as well. Indeed, yeah. I mean, it would have been a surprise if it kept growing like at that rate. Yeah. You know. Well, plus it's the I summer. Guess. You know, I mean, you kind of get the, the yeah. weather's warm. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe some of these things. <laughs> people get out. And people are like, oh, I just did a massive. Maybe everyone got all of their jobs out, adverts out, hiring somewhat, you know. True underway in the first once the budgets were released i think that is normal that maybe it will start to taper off slightly um, for the next couple of months i mean let's see who knows but it wouldn't be surprising. is the pattern consistent with two years ago obviously not a year ago because then that's it was a just good that's a good point yeah i would i would need to go back and check um but yeah it, it's okay. possible yeah i don't i only really remember the seasonal dip in january that has that has happened um for the part has consistently. happened again, right? um, okay but yeah, yeah, it'll be interesting to look back and see what's happened in previous years. Yeah, let's let's continue to expand on that index. Mm. Maybe see what roles are getting uh, hired at some point. But yeah, it's mm. it's it's already quite a lot of data that we're crunching. So, um, moving to the Netherlands, the quote unquote controversial we call it the controversial Dutch language RFP begins. Yeah. Just uh, give us a quick brief on that. Well, yeah, I had to rewind and work out why it was controversial. Uh, but <laughs> I think I figured it out, which is because uh, it, it is a, a developing saga of a story uh, that we have tracked for sort of a year, over a year now, I think. Um, we, it's what has happened now is that there is a new tender uh, for translation services, just translation, no interpreting in this one that the Dutch ministry has, has put out in, in May. So it's part of a wider uh, tendering push, I suppose, for want of a better word, um, that is happening by the Dutch ministry. Um, and I think overall, in total, there's supposed to be something around 20 plus individual contracts that are part of this tendering uh, process. Um, so this one, I mean, we can dive into why why it's controversial. But I mean, just to give you the headline figures as well on this one, this tender is... Uh, estimated at around 33 million euros or around 40 million dollars that's covering two years and a five-month implementation period it that's somewhat um of a threshold sort of ceiling um, and i think it's also supposed to be something in, in the region of 5.5 million euros over the year so they kind of multiplied it up a bit to give some bandwidth um, for the value. Um, so the, this contract is four lots divided geographically. Um, and the idea is to assign each lot to one LSP only. So I think herein kind of lies some of what the controversy is surrounding. Um, the Dutch interpreters, translators, um, we have covered this before, but they were very unhappy about, A, the fact that these tenders are even being released in the first place. They would rather that the assignments were granted to individual linguists directly. 
Um, and I think there was, you know, there was some strike action that happened. There was a petition that's happened. They were talking about forming a new association at one point. Um, and there's also this thing called the Register of Sworn Interpreters and Translators, the RBTV, um, which they, the translation, some translators and interpreters have also taken issue with um, because they're saying that actually the way that it's handled is not is not particularly good, doesn't give the best quality of interpreting and translation. Um, the reason for that is because the... So I think uh, to begin with, they wanted... Translation and interpreters were wanting the proficiency level of the linguists who were allowed onto the register to be C1. So that's kind of a super high mm -hmm. level second highest level I think you can get in, in that kind of denomination of qualifications. Um, but some of the register has apparently allowed interpreters with B2 qualifications, which they say is obviously going to eventually have a bit of an impact on on the quality uh, of the interpreting that is that's delivered. So I think that's more or less the the controversy and the tender. But this is only a small part of what's what's likely to come, which is extra, more contracts. That kind of reminds me of, A, the Danish situation. Yeah. I think there was might have been something in Sweden and also in the UK, right? Yes, With, the NRPSI. Uh, I think there was recently the NRPSI and then that, uh, well, okay, I don't recall, but Baroness, there was a Baroness Cousins. Cousins, Cousins. Cousins, cousins. okay. Yeah. So that that's recent. I think we... Uh, what was that about? That was something kind of similar, right? There was a, there was a list, and then well, it got tendered out, and so now there's continuing to be pushback on kind of making this corporate. Uh, yeah, so of I like think having uh, all these. Yeah. yeah, no, I think that there's a couple of lists in circulation, but I think the the NRPSI who runs the NRPSI, the the Register of Interpreters in, um, in the UK, um, wants their list to be effectively the master list for ver you know, various di different settings, including in the courts. Whereas I think for the courts, mm -hmm. um, the MOJ, uh, there is a private list, as you said, which is held by, I believe, the LSP that has the contract. And so I think they want the... The association, anyway, is call, calling for more transparency around how the list is managed, who's on the list, uh, things like that. So it, it, you're right; it is quite similar in terms of, you know, want being a bit preoccupied with how giving some scrutiny to how interpreters and translators, or interpreters in particular, are allowed onto these lists, or are qualified essentially, pre-qualified for delivering these assignments. So the real thing we should investigate is if there has been any effort at centralization that went really smoothly and well. A anywhere and, in the world. <laughs> and, well, anywhere in Europe. Let's let's mm. say anywhere in Europe for now. Because mm. like every time somebody is trying to centralize, make it more corporate, have a, a sole vendor, there's so mm. much pushback from, you know, everyone, from many of the associations, from the interpreters, uh, et cetera. Um, all right, so let's go to a place we rarely venture to, Afghanistan. And um, there we, we picked up on a story here uh, from where the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, this is probably the top military um, person in the U.S., Mark Milley, Miley Milley, don't know, uh, said that they are Milley. Yeah. I think double L, Planning Milley. To, we'll see. <laughs> Milley, okay, Mark Google Milley. After. Uh, the U.S. Uh, is, uh, as they're withdrawing from Afghanistan, the, the U.S. military is, quote, unquote, drawing up plans to evacuate thousands of Afghan interpreters and others mm -hmm. who worked with American troops. And so Mark Milley said, so their plans being developed very, very rapidly here, not f just for the interpreters, but also for a lot of people that have worked uh, with the United States. And some of these interpreters would, uh, or they, they, they're planning to put them on a special immigration Grant visa program, mm. um, and just to make sure that they're safe, because uh, apparently they're um, they're withdrawing fully by, you know, uh, September 11th of mm. all dates. So and pulling out the few thousand remaining troops and contractors from Afghanistan. So, and there was a, a very, uh, I don't know, interesting is the wrong word. Sorry, I'm lacking the proper term mm. here, but like a, 
a story here where a captain of the, the Army Reserve said that he's basically only, he said he's only alive today because his interpreter wow. uh, from the war shot and killed two people who were about to kill that captain uh, in battle. And so mm. there's, you know, obviously these interpreters there are much more than language interpreters. They're pro cultural guides and... Bodyguards and, uh, in this instance. I bodyguards and in this instance mm. and, 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 and soldiers, right? And and so it's uh, it just shows the enormous breadth of this field, right? I mean, you, you have everything from a translator doing specialist work behind a computer to somebody literally, uh, you know, being, being, being on the front, line, and, yeah, yeah, the front line. Yeah, in the battlefield, which mm. is... Uh, which is really amazing. And, um, and so also we spoke about this before when you have, uh, obviously MT and technologies that they're being rolled out. I think we once spoke about one of these projects where they have like a, I think the Coast Guard, they have like a device mm. to bring along. I mean, for, for the battlefield, I guess technology would be when it's only around language would be beneficial, of course, because you well, need fewer people. But yeah, it's just, it's a, it's a, it's a touching story, and uh, I hope all of these um, interpreters are, you know, are uh, enabled to go to to a safe place and, mm. and start their lives somewhere else. So, on quick internal announcement: so Slatercon September, uh, we got the date announced. Now it's on September eighth. Mm. Uh, it's going to be another remote one, although we are starting to consider potential options for a in person conference later in the year as things are opening up. Uh, there's actually some in the US, there's, there's a fair amount of conferences restarting, um, but not globally. So we obviously want to have everyone safe, but also be uh, open to many people from around the world. So, but for now, remote September 8th, mark it in your calendar. And then just before we transition over to um, to Simona, I, I, there was a great comment on uh, on LinkedIn around our last podcast, uh, Hans Christian from Stoibert, translator, interpreter uh, on the wind, energy, and offshore uh, space. He said, Slaterpod is seriously technical entertainment. Mm, wow. <laughs> let, me, let me just do a quick, a quick self shout out. I like that. That is high um, praise. I, that is nice to read. Thank you, Hans But it's Christian. good. It's, I, I like that. Seriously technical entertainment. I mean, you know, we, we are trying to break things down that are too technical. Uh, we're but, ticket, uh, trying to tick all know. boxes. It's serious, it's technical, yeah. and it's entertaining. <laughs> That's what I, Exactly. That's why I like that comment. It's serious, it's technical, and it's entertainment. All right. Let's do some more serious technical entertainment okay. with uh, remote simultaneous interpreting and Simona. See you soon. And welcome back to Slaterpot. Today with Simona Andriauskaite, the co-founder and chief business development officer at the RSI provider Interactio. Hi, Simona. Hello, Florian. Nice to meet you. Thanks so much uh, for joining. So you guys were in the news last week. You raised a 30 million Series A round for remote simultaneous interpreting technology and services. So congratulations uh, on that. Thank you. So... Tell us a bit more about um, kind of your personal background, professional background, and, and what got you into this business, uh, kind of the, the founder story we like to get started on uh, on, on Slater Pot. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I've been in the industry for seven years. This is how long Interactive has been out already after this point of our first Series A, uh, like a big round. Um, I've before that, I was actually in a fashion business and uh, doing business development there. Um, and my other co-founder, Hendrikas, who um, is CEO at the company, I was also in a business background and we met at the university. Uh, we used to work at um, so many different projects trying to solve so many different problems. And I think for us, it was always about solutions to a particular like big industry problem that we might come up with um so as you can see we're not guys from the industry and we got in the industry learned that listen to the clients uh, we do that really well and uh, this is how we came up uh, with a solution we also have uh, another co-founder our cto damas labakas so he's a dev guy um, the product guy a person who built uh, the product that we have at the moment um so yeah we gathered seven years ago um, and we actually started solving a bit different problem. Uh, 
it was also in the event industry. So we had an app that turns your phone into a microphone. So if you have um, a question, you sit at the back of the audience. Instead of raising a, a hand, um, you click a button and then talk to your phone and everybody can hear you through the audio system, which was a very fun and uh, interesting thing. And it brought us into many conversations with event organizers. Uh, we actually got pretty big hit in Asia. Uh, apparently, they were using us for karaoke, uh, which... <laughs> Help us to realize that sometimes when you come up to some solution, like technological solution, people might find different ways to use it. And since we were good listeners from the beginning, that was our job, like in business, that's what you do. Uh, we started to see different opportunities and different problems to solve with what we had. So audio streaming was always our strongest uh, site. Uh, microphone was exactly about that. And then when we started to talk to clients um they came up with a solution uh, that they were saying you guys could you make sure that the sound goes other way around so not from the phone to the laptop and then to the audio system but maybe from a laptop to many phones and um, they had the issue with simultaneous interpretation equipment that was very complicated to deliver many errors um, and not that good quality sometimes um, so we listened to the market, made a switch, to, and then in 2015, um, started to work heavily with churches in the U.S. They were actually our first client hmm. because um, one particular church, um, international multilingual church in Lithuania, was the first one to push us towards this pivot because they needed to replace, um, to buy more uh, receivers for interpretation, and that would have cost them a lot of money. Um, and also it was like quite a hassle for them. Um, and then, yeah, churches brought this uh, completely different view and different angle. I think that was the total moment for us for at least two strong reasons and um, built us really good fundamentals. So one was that inevitably when we started, we were thinking that we will potentially replace uh, hardware equipment in conferences and live events into an app. We started to do that for the participants. At the beginning, we did not touch the interpreter side because we knew that we had to provide really good uh, quality and test it way more in order to bring that into action. So we started with attendees because that was something that we had already. We knew how to stream audio to phones. Um, and churches uh, kind of showed us that it was not really replacing hardware into software, because when you read the messages of the people who actually received some content, some message that is really changing their lives, you don't have to be religious to understand that the message is the key. So then we mm. realized that what we do here is we allow people to speak different languages, converse in their preferred language and uh, be closer to other people. So we kind of excluded separation. In church, churches, this is solving exactly that problem. There are 60 million Spanish speakers, and they kind of live separately, right? And churches wanted to connect them. And we just tried to read in comments uh, what they're actually telling us, uh, how it changed their lives, the messages they're able to hear finally. And that was in insane. And then we realized, okay, we're here to solve a very big communication problem, make sure that people can converse in their preferred language. And um, yeah. and That's this, so interesting. S yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, so just finish the thought and probably the second big thing that church has brought us um, is that around like we became a science solution that is able to support the biggest number of events since every Sunday around 100 churches would connect um, and we would uh, be able to scale it really fast. So we learned to work with big audiences, uh, multiple uh, people, big arenas of, of um, participants and um it helped us to scale the technology as well, actually. How did you feel about this basically moving? Like, it sounds like a profitable pivot, right? You had this vision for one for, for one business, but then like you were very quickly pulled into something that was that worked and, and probably paid well. And, and but but strategically moved you into it. I mean, you had to rethink your, your strategy a bit there. Was that was that a comfortable shift or was it like? Was it like, was there a little bit of anxiety about moving, moving the model? It was extremely uncomfortable shift <laughs> because uh, you have one solution, you have business model, you have 
we had a name here like at um, Baltic uh, Startups World. They named us as one of the top startups and so on. We uh, pitched an event, we got exposure and suddenly we had to change the product completely, right? Solving different problem, similar market, but different budgets, different, different everything. So uh, we even had to shut down the app that we had uh, for the mic. So it was very uncomfortable. It was like a big risk, but we kind of felt comfortable after we started um, calling potential clients um, without even having a solution. So before making the pivot. And uh, hmm. once we heard from big organizers who are really struggling with interpretation in the live events, they're not able to support that many languages as they wanted to because uh, it requires booths. You need to find space for them. Um, deliver equipment to the participants was so complicated. Um, people had to stand in a lines for hours in some cases uh, to receive um, interpretation receiver and so on. And then we realized that, okay, we, we are here to solve a problem. We know already some potential clients before even having the solution. And that kind of gave a little bit of um, strength and um, safety probably for us that we knew that this will be solution a strong big problem so so i have a question um, just a bit about the solution uh is interactio providing the technology only or do you have also a you know a, a large pool of qualified interpreters that you work with do your clients then sort of source interpreters from you or do they bring your bring their own how, how does that work mm, that's a really good question so as i mentioned when we started we only replaced uh, participants, um, receivers into mobile app. We did not want to go into interpreters tools before we actually got the right feedback, we, before we did the proper research and we could be able to do that in a quality way. Um, later on, when we were actually able to do that, and I think only 2018, we added remote interpretation when it was closer to quality that we wanted. Um, then we added remote interpreter side. And at the beginning, we were still providing only technology. Later on, we started to see mm -hmm. that for the client, they also want us to own the full service because we can also control the quality then because we needed to train their interpreters uh, or train some interpreters, right? And in, in order to be able to provide that service, um, we started cooperating with language solution companies so the agencies that provide interpreters, mm. um, because they would do the quality assurance for us. Lately, uh, I would say, especially in the last year, many interpreters started to apply directly to us, um, asking for cooperation, because that also is, some, in some cases, easier for everybody. So now we have a mix, I would say, a combination. In some cases, we have clients interpreters that we train happily, um, in some cases, client requires uh, to provide full solutions. So in that case, we either cooperate with language solution companies or we have a database of uh, our freelancers um, that uh, apply directly. Hmm. I see. And you spoke a, a, a bit earlier about the, the church and that use case, um, which I think is, is fascinating, um, by the way. But tell us a bit more about the, the wider addressable market for Interactio. What kinds of companies and organizations make up this addressable market and how, how do you view that? Mm -hmm. So when we started with churches, uh, almost at the same time, we started to work with conferences. It was like live on-site events were our cup of tea. This is where we were um, scaling. And up to COVID, um, we started to work with extremely large events. So we supported the event with 120,000 people, 60,000, 70,000 people. Um, some of them were in US, some in Europe, Asia. We had um, uh, one of the last events, I think 2019 was a web summit. Um, many people were there. Um, and um, they had so many different rooms at the same time. So we kind of reached the large events market because we were able to support the scale as i mentioned churches kind of helped us mm. to to bring that those numbers up and to provide technology that can support it um and then some um on i, I would say online events started to happen um internal meetings more like in corporates as well so we up to now still have like some um, I don't know, there's one client in Japan that is using us three times per day 
because they need interpretation that often. And it's just uh, meetings, like online meetings or on-site meetings. Um, and then once COVID hit, um, on the top of those verticals that I just mentioned, so uh, community events such as churches or even mosques, we had um, plus conference organizers and uh, large events uh, and um, corporate meetings. And on top of that, once COVID hit, we got um, in touch with so many institutions, and that is now our primary market, I would say, because when COVID hit, naturally, they had the biggest issue. Like conferences, they could be postponed. They could be delayed, and many event organizers did that. But um, for institutions, for European institutions, UN, like they were not able to communicate, and this is their primary job to solve uh, global issues like this one, right, that, that COVID brought. And multilingual communication suddenly became impossible um, because on-site meetings are not happening. They cannot happen. And all of their tools to provide multilingual communication were on-site. So naturally, they had to do fast and um, like sudden shift in order to be able to work even. So we um, started to focus on this because we had uh, talks with them already in 2019, uh, like end of it, uh, end of the year. Um, but for institutions, for many of them, it was like two years project probably to start with a remote mm -hmm. participation so that participants can work remotely. Um, and that turned into something that they had to deliver way faster. Um, and yeah, this is now our T primary Tell me, probably feels like an eternity now, the start, the start of COVID, right? Because yeah. probably a lot has happened since for you guys. But like, just tell me about those initial first weeks and, and the thinking on your side. Like, you know, you mentioned the Web Summit. I mean, this type of business basically wiped out. And then all of a sudden you get this interest from little like world changing discussions like with, you know, the UN and, 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 and the European Union. Like, how was that from a business perspective? How did you, how did you go through this phase? And, and like, how did you prioritize things? Interesting thing is probably that we didn't really have this gap where there would be nothing happening um, because, as I mentioned, like there we had some discussions with institutions already at the end of the year, like right before mm. beginning of 2020. So we were kind of working on many projects there, like long term projects in a way. Um, and then there were many corporate meetings that simply never stopped. Um, but conferences, yes, we started to see many cancellations, postponing events, and so on. And that was okay, interesting, like what it was, will it be happening next? But almost instantly, institutions started to approach us uh, or continue the conversations that we started. And probably important thing is that um, right like a uh, few months back uh, ISO standard for remote interpretation was launched and like initiated uh, what it meant for the industry is that finally like remote interpretation had standards had quality assurance right in a way up to then it was really not possible to meet any criteria because there were no criteria for that um, and I think that was a big push that was also initiated by institutions by the way and this is where we met, like um, all the key RSI platforms met, um, institutions, interpreters, hardware manufacturers, and we all started to cooperate on so many things. So for us, the first like months of 2020 and probably when COVID hit, it was more about, okay, so, you know, this demand started to come right away. There was no gap or thinking, you know, where to go. This demand just started to come from the different places. The places that we saw as a long-term project started to become uh, that you know uh, short-term. We needed it now, so for us it was a very very tough uh, time because we had to. Uh, we knew what institutions wanted, and they gave their instructions carefully to us. Um, and to deliver that, we needed basically to redesign our pro product completely and to remake it. So for us, this was the time when we were the most efficient ever, probably, uh, because it used to be that, you know, in the evening of the day, we received the feedbacks from institutions, like what, they tested the system, they saw how it works. Overnight, our developers are providing the needed changes. And over the day, in the evening, we meet again with institutions trying to hear the further feedback, sharing what we did over the day. And literally that happened for a few weeks. 
um, until we had what they needed. Uh, and um, in a way, the product that we have now is almost custom made uh, from the feedback of institutions. So team worked like crazy. We put all of our hearts there because we knew that this is the time to make things happen and to uh, solve the barrier that really appeared for the multilingual communication. So wow. for raising ones, and we still remember and the legendary stories about uh, the crazy <laughs> work that the team did. It's a well, yeah. I mean that that cycle with the client almost being your uh, well, not almost being your development partner. Like uh, that, that must have been super stressful, but also exciting. Um, hey, I, I have a, just a question from a linguistic point of view because we have a, a fair amount of also linguists that listen to this. Um, like from a linguistic perspective, RSI kind of the lack maybe of visual cues uh, and some of the other challenges. That's one area that I guess you're you're you have to solve for, but also the whole latency issue. I'm not sure, is that still a thing or not so much? Just kind of these two technical mm. challenges and how you approach them and deal with them. Mm. Technical challenges, that's our favorite topic. Um, and basically delay is not a problem at all uh, in what we have right now because we were we solved that problem years ago when we had live events. Because in a live event, this is where you need to have extremely low delay. We had studies where our clients, uh, conference organizers, uh, would try to create a solution like ours, but would get like 20 second delay. Um, and then when they see us having like uh, 200 milliseconds delay for them, it's like, how is this even possible? But we had to turn there in order to be able to support the on-site events. That was like our primary task for the last uh, few years, right? So delay was not really an issue. The issue, I would say, once we fixed, uh, in general, we built uh, the video uh, quality, the audio quality that was needed. And we always historically focused on quality ra rather than features. We always were the, one, uh, the ones a bit behind in terms of um, features because we thought we can build them anytime when it's needed, really requested by the client. But the, like, the audio and video quality was the number one priority for us always. So that was kind of easier challenge. Actually, one unexpected challenge once COVID hit was that we made um, video quality that was higher than usual. And I don't know if you noticed, but when everybody connected online, when people were supposed to stay on at home, the connection, internet connection everywhere, like crashed uh, a lot. Mm. Um, and this was unique challenge that you could not even uh, think of that all the world would connect online because they have nowhere to go. That was the beginning of mm. the COVID, right? So um, this was something that we had to fix, like to kind of lower the quality of video a little bit so that it matches with um, huge traffics that were simply at that time um, happening in the internet. Um, and then I would say that up to now, the biggest challenge, like the technical challenge that we have, it's not a really on... Um, speaker delivery to the participants it's not really on interpreter side because interpreters we, we train them we have hubs where they are located sometimes and they kind of know what equipment they need to have what uh, internet speed they need to have we, they kind of run through those tests already the biggest technical problem is the participants uh, side of things so when we have remote participation happening um, how to ensure that Participants are using microphones, that they have a stable connection, that all of them are following the uh, requirements that were held so that interpreters can get good quality. So it's not like this is still remains the biggest challenge. And we know this uh, because we have talked to so many interpreters and we're kind of running those researches now, trying to see where the biggest problems are. Uh, so communication towards attendees and making sure that attendees comply with what is needed so that interpreters can do their job well, this is one of the biggest issues. We try to go around that, um, like for including things in a contract, like the requirements and so on, but it's still not a full solution to that. Right now we have the whole team that is actually working towards solving things like that. We still see that we could um, add some incentive there for the participants, uh, there are probably multiple different solutions, but it, surprisingly, this is the biggest challenge at the moment. It's interesting um, 
thinking about interpreters and some of the objections or some of the challenges that they might face when when transitioning or shifting to working with or working remotely um quite simply what are some of the other i mean are there any other objections that you're that you hear from interpreters at the moment that are big concerns and has that changed pre-pandemic to now mm. this is a great question I think um, when we just started this, as I mentioned, like uh, we were kind of trying to solve the problem for the client, for the end users mm. and the client, basically. And then once we realized that this is in general, like um, we are the bridge for the interpreters, participants, and the clients and the speakers, um, mm. we started to see, okay, so started to talk to interpreters. And definitely there was a big resistance from their side that we saw from the beginning. They were naturally afraid of, you know, what work conditions this will bring. Like if remote interpretation will become the way of working, you know, what, how this will even look like. And we got a lot of resistance. Um, I think we did quite a lot of more education, uh, quite a lot of demos, trainings, and so on. And would try to hear out their objections and try to see how we can solve them. Um, I would say that the be in the beginning, the major questions were around the working environment and like, mm. you know, how to make sure that when I work from home, I will have the support needed, right? Like, how do I communicate also with my partner, like booth partner? Um, how, like, what happens if um, something happens to my connection or some noise is coming and so on? So some solutions were provided by the, industry pat patterns themselves like um, there are now interpreter hubs in multiple cities where you can come and do, interpret where they monitor you help you out there are technicians and so on uh, there are also hmm. so many um i would say testing environments for interpreters to make sure that you know we we have automated tests that uh, runs um and we know we can control the interpreter environment in a technical way we can see if they're connected to Ethernet cable, if the battery is connected to the laptop, uh, we can let them know about the speed of their internet and so many things were developed in general, like in terms of tools. Uh, so those objections are less frequent now uh, after COVID, I would say, since it's mm -hmm. more clear how the environment should look like. And they have done that many times probably already. So it's becoming like easier. Um, I would say that uh, right now, we have very different concerns from different interpreters. In our case, um, we tend to work more with um, senior interpreters, the ones that work with institutions at the moment, uh, because they're also more junior interpreters that are just starting their journeys or do not have a lot of experience. So for them, it's probably way different questions and different challenges. From the institutional interpreters and senior interpreters, um, they still work a lot with the hybrid events, and we mostly do hybrid uh, meetings in institutions. So this is something where we are even integrating with the hardware on site um, to make sure that some interpreter can be working in institution using the equipment that is there, uh, but maybe other interpreters are in a hub, maybe some of them are at home. Um, so those uh, challenges for them um, are more about, I would say, the, qual the, the quality of providing the hybrid meeting. So what to do if my partner is on site, but I am online, let's say, you know, how, how to overcome those type of things. And, and I imagine that um, for us, like the biggest concern that they have is that what if uh, every interpreter institutions would go online? Uh, that would be a big problem for them because some of them do not want this. It's not comfortable for them in general, or they work in Brussels anyway, so they could come there on site. Um, so I think the solution that we are providing here is like we even partner with some manufacturers of equipment um, and we provide direct integrations so that they have tools, they have flexibility, like even being in the same booth, providing interpretation to the same language, one interpreter could be online and could and other could be on site. That was not even possible before. So our goal is probably now to provide flexibility and not compromising the quality. That's probably their biggest concern at the moment. So that's like a broad, broad answer to, to your question. I would say that 
still a lot of objections are or concerns are still about the um, how to ensure the quality for the from coming from the participant side uh, something that i mentioned before so uh this is not really something that we control fully right um but we aim to we we, we see this as our responsibility anyways so yeah many hey, what about changes mm-hmm. Sorry, what about those hubs? So who sets, so you're saying there's like hubs in cities where interpreters will go in and there's, I don't know, it's a soundproof environment. It's a, it's a mm-hmm. fast internet connection and it's just set up. Like who sets up those hubs? And like, yeah, I mean, is that like interpreter driven, just kind of community and they just set it up themselves or? Oh, no, 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 there... no. That would be uh, very complicated for them to take care of the technical uh, details probably of, of their environment. Um, in fact, like interpreter hubs, it's not something that uh, appeared now overnight. This is something that we have done pre COVID as well. Um, and so it's oh, sorry, very much. So y- yes. You guys set this up? Uh, like you're y- setting up these yes interpreters? Yes and no. Uh, so in the past, okay, you- we used to kind of do this um, for specific clients. Let's say we had a, um, a medical client that has a huge, had a huge conference in Singapore and their interpreters, the agency that they work with, were set in Germany. So they needed secure environment, they needed super top quality, they wanted tech support to be next to them and so on. So what we did there, we kind of uh, set up the studio, recording studio in Germany where our technicians came and we rented it. We put our laptops for them so that interpreters just come, they interpret, they don't have to worry about it. And there's some Hmm. physical support if needed, right? Uh, So in a way, in those cases, we support this. Uh, For us, it's like going to on-site event. We usually send our technicians there. Mm, But in many other cases, uh, when the client needs this on a frequent basis, like institutions now uh, are needing it, they are the ones that are actually owning the hubs. We're just here to support them uh, any way possible. So I would say that when the more frequent usage is needed, client wants to own a place like this or have it in their own environment. And then we're only supporting them with this. But um, we also have cases where we can own that, just renting a recording studio with soundproof, like uh, high quality environment. So it's a mix, I would say. Got it. Mm. And you mentioned about the sort of collaboration or integration with with some of these um, equipment providers. I'm wondering beyond that, do you work, for example, with uh, technology, other tech companies or big tech at all? Some of the platforms or anything? How What's the relationship like there, if there is anything? Mm-hmm. Um, so interesting fact is that last year we worked, um, our platform was working together with 43 different video streaming platforms, which I think it's a very high number. And we were even surprised mm-hmm. when we got that stats. Uh, and we here talk about um Zoom, YouTube, and, you know, like very, very different ones that uh, clients are using, uh, which shows that we realize that, you know, we have our own full solution. Like we have our own Zoom sort of with interpretation. We have multilingual video meetings platform, right? Um, but in some cases, clients have only a few meetings that need interpretation, but the other online meetings are happening on their own preferred platform. In that case, for them to switch between platforms is just not really convenient. So in those cases, we do, we restream the event to our platform so that uh, Mm -hmm. interpreters can use professional tools. Um, And then participants are using, you know, the platform of their choice. So we kind of do those um, workaround um, integrations in a way um, with multiple Mm -hmm. different platforms. Uh, Talking about the direct partnerships um well there was a time when i would say those video platforms are receiving the requests so this they still like send us their clients sometimes even like recommend but it's more like informal recommendations that are happening since they're not providing anything like that but they know that we work we're compatible to work with their platform so it's more like an official partnerships i would say that we had um but in our case, I would say that since this year, still the goal is, um, and our primary target is institutional space and professional events. 
um, we comply or um, kind of integrate mostly with the platforms that institutions use. So this is kind of our priority at the moment. Later on, we definitely will expand further in the corporate space because we have quite many corporate clients already. Um, but to comply with what um, institutions need in terms of security and, and all of those things, make sure that that platform that they use also can comply with what we have because we're kind of building security com uh, compliance and all of those things quite heavily now. Um, that is very important. Would you would you put the all these kind of fast emerging video conferencing platforms uh, in the same kind of big tech bucket, or would you think about them differently? Like at Slater, we're using Hopin now for our remote mm -hmm. conferences, and it's a pleasure. It's actually quite cool to work with it. Uh, but there's there's a lot of other um, uh, you know such tools. I mean, I'm getting probably one email cold approach a day from like uh, one of those uh, mm -hmm. tools, but I mean, Hopin is, I guess, the leader. Yeah. So how, how do you think about those? Same bucket, big tech, or kind of a different um, a, a different category? Mm -hmm. So for us, um, I would say that we don't think about them too much because um, our side of things is provide professional interpretation to the end client, right? So whenever um, our big clients are requesting for certain integrations we make sure to do it because they know that that platform is compliant already it's secure it went through all the check marks for them so that we know that you know uh, we just need to work with them and that's it um, we are not uh, in a strategy right now to uh, integrate or comply compl be compliant with any platform out there so we don't really need to segment them right now that's this is not our I would say priority at this moment, but that market itself is definitely very interesting, right? Like we have a more niche segment because we work with multilingual needs um, and we're here to be an add on when needed to certain platforms. Uh, but talking about the smooth integrations, like we at the moment don't aim to be uh, integrated to any video platform. Good. And, and maybe going back to some of the operational um, realities, really, and, and specifically if you're working with a pool of interpreters, I know you said some interpreters had started to contact you directly, mm -hmm. for example, but in terms of operations, I mean, as that potentially scales the pool of the pool of interpreters, how do you handle things like interpreter scheduling, managing diff or sourcing different language combinations, for example? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um, and for that reason, uh, we still work with agencies quite a lot. And as I mentioned, like that was uh, our I would say strategy from the beginning since they do the quality assurance. Um, we at the moment are working with around 1,000 interpreters that are on our database, which is not a big number um, at all. Um, for us, the biggest challenge is and always has been to provide quality in whatever add-ons we have in our services. So in this case, the biggest challenge is definitely to provide um, the right segmentation of interpreters to do this quality assurance, the qualification in a way. And that is very complicated topic in general, right? Like how do you, um, out of the pool of interpreters that come in, how do you segment them? Currently, we have multiple criteria. So some of it is... Um, simply their education, uh, their certificates that they hold already. Uh, that is very often the needed uh, quality. And uh, there are also like uh, different topics that they are experienced working with. And now we're also receiving the feedbacks from participants. And um, this is some, something we will be uh, kind of integrating into that qualification. So that in general, there are two big topics for us now to cover with uh, talking about interpreters so one is qualification, how to do that correctly and even better than we do now. You make sure that a client gets what they are really expecting. And that also, because it's always our platform is associated with the quality that um, uh, interpreters are providing. Um, and the other is definitely the training. So how compliant they are with our platform. And that comes um, to the client's interpreters as well, but also the ones that we are kind of booking. Um, so trainings and qualification, definitely two big um, areas that we're now exploring further and investing in. 
Let's move from one end of the extreme, like from the highly professional um, interpreter to the all this uh, language technology and all this, uh, the, the space, right? All these speech to speech technologies, um, you know, automated things in, in natural language processing. Like, how, how, how do you follow this? Do you follow this? Is it, is it a distraction? Because your business currently probably isn't, I mean, there's no automated kind of machine translated machine interpreting component to it or is it something you're like uh, closely monitoring well uh, we are more or less in this industry that's true so we are kind of monitoring the industry and seeing what is happening what is new but at the same time uh, we strongly believe in having one focus at a time and at the moment um, you know having client list like we have Providing the quality in whatever we do is the number one thing. We cannot fail at that. They are, you know, very, um, it must be error free. So in our case right now, that focus is really to provide um, compliant technology, uh, best audio and video quality possible, uh, very smooth for the participants and to have a quality uh, assurance that is really matching with industry standards for the interpreters. When we talk about um, other add-ons on the top of that, and there are many, right? Like um, AI automated translation is just one of it probably. The other can be multiple different features that we may provide with our platform. This is something that um, we more, uh, I would say, implement on demand when we see that our big clients are requesting something like that. At the moment where we don't have plans to work with artificial intelligence or automated translations, definitely something to explore. And definitely our research team is looking into things like that because it can be also, uh, there must maybe some tools to support interpreters um, for the starters and who knows where this end up in 20 years from now. Uh, but at the moment, like this is not our key focus. Uh, we're just keeping our eyes open probably. Talking about the further tools for interpreter expansion. Got it. So let's close on on, on a question around your recent fundraise, Series A. Um, from uh, you know, I have to read this here, but Storm Ventures uh, and then Eight Roads, Change Ventures, Notion Capital, and then Skype's founder Jan Tallinn. Um, so, so, hey, how did you get? Maybe how did this come about? Like, did they reach out? Did you reach out? Was it um, uh, more of a kind of yeah, again, they're coming to you or, or reaching out. And then the second part of the question would be, what's the plan now? Like, where do you want to grow maybe beyond this kind of core of remote simultaneous interpreting? Or what are some of the strategic priorities for, for the next couple of years now that, you know, mm-hmm. you have that uh, 30 million? Yeah, that's quite a big series around for sure. Um, that's it probably is. the largest in our industry so far. But that is because we did not raise uh, fund, like huge funds before. Um, we were definitely playing around this idea for a while. We were trying to see, okay, Series A is the next uh, step, definitely s- to scale things up. And we started conversations uh, with investors a while ago, uh, really like um, when you are a startup or scale-up company, I think you always have a network of interpreters that you talk, of uh, investors that you talk to from the beginning because that's a relationship that you're kind of building. So we knew some of those investors a while ago. Um, they knew us. So it's you know never coming just overnight. You don't uh, include random investors probably. Because mm, that connection, the value that they can give, and you see like it's uh, uh, venture capitals that have unicorns in their portfolios. It's um, angel investors that have done something similar in the audio space and You know, this is something that we really needed as a value add-on, not only money-wise, I would say. Um, So we were playing with this idea of, you know, fundraising um, for a while, I would say. But then, to be honest, like, we we came to the point where the demand that we had was such a big that we all had our hands full of things to do. And um, last year and a half probably was full of events we're now supporting what 2000 events per month and that's crazy uh, and we had things to do and um, we kind of started those conversations a while ago but never really proceeded and now probably the time came to really accelerate on things we know exactly what we're doing now we have uh, the top uh, industries events uh, happening through us 
uh, we have a direction to improve the quality on all of those levels and include industry top people in our team. That's kind of one of the goals of this round to get the uh, best quality in, in, in all levels. Um, so the time came and um, definitely like uh, the, I would say we, we became in a the very hot topic, right? Like COVID hit and yeah. there were a number of uh, problems to invest in, in general. And that was one of them. So we got a pretty good demand um, uh, from the different uh, venture capitals, I would say. And we chose the best ones, the, the ones that were able to support us and probably will be adding a lot of value in, in between. That's a, that's a strong position. Uh, that's a strong position to start from when, you, uh, when you're too busy to raise capital. And uh, <laughs> so congratulations on that. And that must have been a super busy year. So I know, well, things are continuing to be busy for you. So uh, thanks so much for, for taking the time to, to do this. Uh, this is very valuable for a lot of people in this industry, you know, from the interpreters to, you know, of course, also the investors and, uh, and probably a lot of the LSPs that are, are partnering with you. So thanks so much for taking time today, Simona. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.